Do you think that's a step in the right direction? It'd be interesting to see what he's doing it based on. I'm, I'd just be interesting to see what he's basing the firing on. Is he, has he determined that he wrongfully entered? Did he determine that he just wantonly fired shots? Just be interesting. I think I, I have to wait to form an opinion on that to see what are you really saying he did wrong here. It's a complicated case. It's crazy complicated. Because the warrant was legal. I mean, so. If it, if it was, I mean, I think all of us still legally, had, right. Well, let me backtrack. If it was obtained legally, correct information on it, nothing along that. So we even have to go back to that point, right? So if it was obtained legally with correct information, it's going to get even more tangled. Yes, absolutely. When the police report came out on Breonna Taylor's death and it said injuries, none, mm -hmm. um, forced entry, no. That cast such suspicion. How, A, how was that even released? And B, that's where distrust comes in. Yeah, it's the part of the truth part before we can ever, you said, you, you said Vet, come talk to me about moving, moving forward. And I always say, you know, the truth has to come before reconciliation. And if we're looking at a piece of paper that says shot eight times and dead is not an injury, um, who's really ready to move forward and do something different? Um, and I don't know. Preliminary, preliminary reports are preliminary reports, but I mean, it's been how many months, so it's not preliminary anymore. So I don't, I was baffled by that. that, that People took that as disrespect. They, they did, and I don't, I don't know the answers to it. And that's why I don't want to come across as somebody who knows why that happened or what, I mean, it's just not acceptable. It's just not acceptable. It doesn't, it doesn't help anybody. I mean, shot eight times and dead is, is injured <laughs> at the very least, right? right. That we, we can document that. That's just a fact. And that's what bothers me about people not, you know, the rest of us out here looking for facts, just wanting some facts. You know, if we'd have, I think if most people would have just read that report and it was, would have properly documented what we all know happened now at this point, uh, because it, we got it so late. If we got it the uh, hour into it, because it doesn't become a real report until it is ratified by the commanders, it goes through several phases. Uh, but even initially, you know, gunshot wounds. Right. Um, but to so them. that's what bothers me about what is the, who is really ready to, to say that we're ready to, to move forward and have transparency. That's the part people get overwhelmed with the words of transparency. We're going to be transparent. That's not transparency. And that's not helpful. And I think a lot of people, you, you put people in a position to get hurt on both ends, the officers, protesters, when you just have that much anger. People were angry about that, and rightfully so. This is one of the tipping points that's going on in our community, specifically here in Louisville. Um, George Floyd, obviously the other. When you watch that video as a former deputy chief in the police department, what went through your mind with all your police experience when you watch that video? I think um, the, the first few minutes, it was going back to that time as a police officer, but the, I think the last five minutes was just the mother. <laughs> I just couldn't get past being a mother in that. Um, I struggled so hard to see the officer with his hands in his pocket and his knee on his neck because policing is hard and it is dangerous and stuff gets ugly sometimes, right? It does, it, it gets ugly. Um, but just the callousness in it, it was hurtful. It, it was just so hurtful to say, if you, if you thought your life was in danger enough to, to you know, suffocate a man to death, you, you wouldn't have your hands in your pockets. When you saw that, did you realize that, oh gosh, this is going to be that tipping point. This is where we're going to see protesting and all of the things that have happened since then. Did you think when you saw that, that this is the one that really is going to... I did, because I mean, as horrible as it was, I think everybody got to see it and feel a different way. And I, I think it was that one incident that you could not deny was problematic. Um, because for so long, I think we, we look for that incident that's really going to get people's attention to say there, there are problems and we need to address them. Um, but people's attention span gets so short. I just re really felt like the George Floyd was going to be that galvanizing um, 
incident that his death would not be in vain, that we would move forward as a country across all systems. You know, it's not just law enforcement that has some changing to do. Court. It's community, it's court, it's it's families, it's neighborhoods. I mean, it's a, it's a lot of things that have to be fixed. And I think if we can come to the table as a result of that, his death won't be in vain. So we've seen these cases before. We've seen a lot of talk. Everybody is saying now it needs to be action. Mm -hmm. So where does it start? Let's talk law enforcement because that's your field of expertise. Uh, is enough training in place? Is enough um, culture in place in police departments, specifically LMPD, do you believe, to tackle these kinds of issues? I think the diversity has to be increased. I think African-American officers now are 11 percent. It's less now than it was when I was on the police department. Um, and it's, it, it's going to be, it's, it's a hard job. Nobody wants to do it anymore. Um, once they change the retirement and, and the benefits that you used to have, you don't get paid a lot. Um, so just getting good people to want to step up and do it, it's going to be very, very tough, black and white. But you do need to increase the diversity. Um, I think that's a part of it. I think the educational requirement hurt law enforcement across the country. Um, I think that change happened about 15 years ago. It made officers so young um, because you had to have college education. So we lost a lot of the experienced uh, 35, 40 year old military guys, um, you know, mothers, fathers that had tried other occupations and, you know, didn't necessarily have college, but always had that desire. You lost them. You didn't get to have them as applicants anymore. So you were just getting young kids coming out of college without the life experience out here in a tough, dangerous world, trying to navigate their way through it. And they hadn't had the lived experiences. So uh, I think getting the right people in board is, I think, Training is a part of it, um, but you know you can only train for knowledge, skill, or ability. You can't train morality, really. Um, so it's about getting the right people in that care about people. So you brought that up because you said racism and morality. There's no policy that's going to get rid of those problems. I want to start with what you see good in LMPD, and then I want to talk about what you see are the challenges okay. in LMPD. So, because I always feel like I, I don't want to couch negative first. Right. So let's couch positive first. It's a tough job. We all know that. So what good do you see when you were there and what you see now? The good is it's a lot of great people there. I mean, the majority, the overwhelming majority are a lot of great young people, a lot of great people who have been there for a while that just stay because they want to help. Because you can take your pension now and go anywhere. They can cash out and go work for any company. It's, it's a lot of good people in there that want to do good. Um, so that's the positive. Now let's tackle the negative. What culture do you see in LMPD that you think needs to be changed? And has it always been there even when you were there? Or is it, you know, gotten better, gotten worse? I don't know. I think the culture is the overall culture in law enforcement. It, within LMPD, it's a lot of younger officers now. But um, there's a culture of negativity you know, that gets passed on by some people who probably shouldn't be training officers, who shouldn't be that. And there is a backdrop of what law enforcement just has been in our country forever, right? And then the lack of knowledge of that. Um, when I talk to people about, you know, police officers were used to round up slaves back then. So when you don't know that history and you don't know what that uniform represents to some people, you have to know that. And, and so you have, have, have officers been, and they haven't, they haven't, we have had a Spanish emergent program, but there was really nothing ever been for the African American culture. So when you take somebody young, who's never grew up in the city, who may have gone to a, maybe a private school or something, and just has never really been engaged with black people. And the first time they get engaged is they have a gun on their hip and they're going in somebody's house, telling them what to do. That's a, that's a tough situation. And the second thing is police officers are being asked to do everything. And that's not, that's not appropriate either. Um, you got mental health issues, you have addiction issues, but after five o'clock, the police officer is supposed to be the expert in all of it. Right. And that's just not realistic. And I think they're getting put, when people say we're being over-policed, I think people have too much contact with the police because police are doing too many things. Um, so when people say to me, you should defund or divest, I don't think it's a bad thing to divest, but make them take the work with them. You can't just take the money and not take the work. So when we see that, like especially what happened in Camden, New Jersey, it was a police department wrought with problems and they ended up, and I think the defunding and, and some of that, the wording gets people thrown yeah, a little yeah. bit. Some of it's taking that money and putting in community services that you said 
some pol police really shouldn't be doing right. to a degree. I mean, um, before I left, they really had that crisis intervention training and we took like a 40 hour class on how to deal with people with mental illness. Now you know most people, most people that deal with people with mental illness have PhDs or at least master's degrees uh, to become a clinical therapist or a psychiatrist or something like that. 40 hours is not it, right? <laughs> um, and so after four or five o'clock, the offices are closed. Most of the hospitals that we knew, you know, all of our life have either minimized their capacity or closed altogether for mental health. Um, and it's just a police officer out there trying. Um, and then the same thing with addiction, that now they're carrying Narcan and they're out there trying to revive people. Those are things that other people need to take on that responsibility. If you did that, you would minimize people's contact with the police tremendously. And that is important. When people feel like they are, you know, every time I turn around, I got a police, it, it just feels so much. And the officers have no choice. I mean, you know, you can, where do you take a, somebody with mental illness at? 10 o'clock in the morning, at 10 o'clock at night. Who, right. who do you call? They're calling the officer. So these are things, these, these are more community issues, not just policing. You, right, when you talk about divesting, let the mental health community step up, let them learn how to mobilize, um, let, you know, let them come out to these runs when somebody's overdosed, let them come out to these runs when somebody's off their meds and, and don't have the officers doing that. Take the money and the work. Are you troubled by anything that you've seen? I mean, we've seen some stops that have been very questionable in the past couple of years. I think of the one teenager, Tayon, and things like that, that were disturbing to watch for me. And I'm assuming they may have been for you. I don't want to put words in your mouth. But do you see some issues with LMPD as far as when it comes to race relations and things like that? I, I think there definitely is race relations um, that, that have to happen. But I think a lot of it is just the the stuff that the policies that that they have no control over like not speaking on pending litigation so what happens is everything just swirls around for months sometimes years because um, that was how many years ago and I, there's still nothing on that still nothing on that so when the truth finally does come out nobody believes it right and so even if the officer wasn't necessarily right or you didn't get the entire story because um, I've been on that side of it too. You know, you can't speak, so everybody's just speaking and making accusations, and you can't speak up for yourself. That's a tough place to be in. Um, and then when it comes, you know, or the, either there's no follow-up story at all, or when the things come out, they just believe that, that you're lying. Um, so it's a tough place to be in, and that's beyond the officer's control as it relates to poor communication. How do you weed out bad officers? Is that difficult to do? I, I guess my biggest question is, if there is a culture that, you know, might involve racism or morality and things, it, how tough is it to get rid of a bad officer? Now I saw that the duty to intervene mm -hmm. that, that the mayor talked about yesterday. A, is that something that you think an officer would do if they saw something? And how tough is it to go up against some of that in a police department if it does exist? It was interesting to see it come out as a policy because I, I think that's a moral thing too. Like who wouldn't, you know, try to intervene if they saw that? I mean, I just would believe that most officers would. I think that the officers in that George Floyd, two, three days on the police department, people saying they only had two, three days, but you knew that was wrong. I mean, you know, that's the stuff your mother taught you was wrong. Your grandmother right. taught you was wrong. So I don't know that you should have to have a policy for that. Um, but it's a step forward, right? They're just trying to figure something out. And I get that part of it too. Um, but when, it's just, I've been gone almost six years, you know? So, I, I mean, I hate, I always hated people like Monday morning quarterback, and so I'm not, but I have experiences, right? And I have lived experiences, and I've, I've lived that backlash or, or feeling like I was never the FOP brand. Um, and then, you know, when Chief White was here, the, the racial caricatures and stuff, we would see, you know, drawn on bulletin boards and drawn in things, and some of the hateful stuff we would see online. Within the department. Mm-hmm within there and I can't deny that and I won't deny that because I feel like I feel like the young officers out there that really want to do good are are going to be the ones that continue to just pay the price for the lack of accountability from other people and, and I really do say that because if an officer out there on the street makes a poor decision he should he or she should pay for that decision and I get that um, and if a citizen's out there doing something they shouldn't be, that's justice, right? Justice is, is equal. And I think where, where most people, especially like me as a black officer, I try to explain to people like, 
people are not asking you not to make arrests when you need to. They're not asking for that. They just say like, how does a young man shoot up a church full of people and you put a bulletproof vest on him and take him to get something to eat? And it seems like overwhelming when those incidents happen, when somebody with African-American, they have to die. That's the struggle that people have. That's the question I get asked most common. Um, people are realistic about the issues that have, we have in the community and they want police to take action when it's necessary. But um, you know, Chief White used to always say to me, you can justify anything as a human person, but you have to get to the point in law enforcement where you do what is necessary. And that is a hard adjustment for people um, because I can justify doing just about anything that I shouldn't be doing. That doesn't make it right and that doesn't make it necessary. I saw you put that on Facebook. So now I see where that. Yes. That was the advice he had to me. And so he said, it's going to be tough, right? Um, and he made this, he wasn't popular, but um, I think a lot of times he wasn't popular because he was making us adjust to that, right? So let's say you're chief. Let's say I'm, I'm ordaining you chief right now. Please don't. <laughs> I'll ask you that question as a follow-up. Three things that you would do immediately to change in a culture kind of thing. What do you think are the three steps you would take right away? The first thing I would do is check on the mental health of the, some of the young officers out there. It's tough being out there, screamed at, cussed at. You have no power um, to, 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 you know, to, to really do anything. You're just kind of stuck in the middle. Um, and I, I worry about their mental health and how they're doing on that because they still got a job to do and they still got families to go home to. So I really will take at first internal look at just their mental health and make sure that something stood up for them. Where, where can they go? Who are they talking to? What's in place for that? Making sure they get proper relief because you have to do that. Um, I think that would be the first thing. The second th thing is to really talk to officers and get uh, a pulse on what is really happening and let people have truth. I mean, um, that's the thing. It's like the majority will pounce on you if you don't believe what they believe or, you know, value everybody's lived experience and figure out what the best path is forward. Um, and then try to just quell some of the foolishness that might happen <laughs> um, because, you know, they'll pay somebody millions of dollars to come in and do a review and do all this stuff. And, and that just gets old and it gets tiring. And I don't know that it's always necessary. Like, you're, we're smart people. We know what the right thing to do is. And, and I think th that person has to have the next thing is just to really have more power. I just feel like the mayor's office wields more power than they should. I understand he has responsibility, but they make calls that make it very difficult. So kind of neuter. Is that a right word? I mean, just to just to for him and his office to respect that if you're going to bring a leader in, you got to let him lead like whatever way. And instead I'm, of under the microscope all the time, I'm going to give you an example. The curfew. Typically in law enforcement, if you put a curfew in at 10 o'clock at 10 or one, it needs to be enforced. And to have them stand down because they're not, they're peaceful on Barstown Road right now, so don't, in, don't, don't enforce it, right? I don't think that was a decision that was coming from the police department. I would imagine that was coming from higher up, right? And, and I guess he's just trying to make sure that you don't have another incident, that people are not angry. You give people the right to peacefully protest, but you could have lifted the ordinance instead of making the officers decide. And just say, don't put a don't curfew. Put a curfew. Just don't put a curfew in if you're not going to enforce if it. Because you're, you're putting us in the middle and people are going, what yeah. good's a curfew? And then the people who are upset by the protesters are saying, well, why you're not enforcing? You're not enforcing. And then... So it was no win. And then you got groups in different neighborhoods that are seeing different stuff. So you have people saying, oh, they're peaceful on this block. And other people saying they're not peaceful on this block. So it, it automatically sets them up to make a decision. Right. And if that decision is not equitable then they are gonna have the backlash from it. You know, people are saying, well, why were they down at 26 and Broadway? Why, why don't you just lift the, lift the curfew? So that, that's a really That's good just point. some of the things that this just sits back and it, hurt, it hurts me because I always feel like it's other people left <laughs> to deal with the brunt of other people's decisions. And that's just a decision that I, I felt like was so problematic. What would you say to the mayor if you had a direct line well, let me ask, does he call you and ask your opinion? He um, typically not, but I mean, we've talked a few times, um, just, just maybe in the past two weeks or whatever. And I, and I 
you know, I, I feel like the communication was poor and I, you know, I'm, I'm honest with him. He, he, he takes it, you know, um, I felt like some of the communication decisions that he made um, were not helpful. Um, and to communicate without saying anything is not necessarily helpful. Um, so if we're going to be communicating with people and they're attentive, let's give out some things that can be helpful. Um, and so I realized, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a different kind of person. And, and so, you know, people kept saying, you should go back and you should apply to be chief. And, um, Would you? I, I don't think I, I don't think I have that interest anymore because I really don't think I would be given the autonomy to do what I felt like I would need to do. Um, and, and I feel like people trust me. I'm a, I'm an honest person, you know, I'm not perfect. Um, but there's some, some conversations that need to be had and there's some, some changes that need to be made and structure and it's not going to be popular. And I'm okay with that. I would be okay with that. Do you think then, let's say you're not interested because I've seen your name floated by, by people out there and I do think you have a lot of uh, trust and respect, especially from, from officers whom I've talked to. So do you think it needs to be an outsider? Because I worry about you don't think it does. I don't think so. I think the learning curve is so. I think the city always has a tendency to think the next best thing is outside. And I don't necessarily, not in these times, I don't think. But do you think it's somebody who could confront the culture and do something about it if you think there are some issues there as an insider? I can't, I think so, if they have the support of the community and, and their boss, which would be the mayor. Does it need to be a person of color? It doesn't have to be. It would be nice to see a female um, something new, right? We've never had that. And I, I see some of my friends that are leading across the country doing great work. Um, we just do stuff a little different, you know? Um, I think when you come on as a police officer, as a female, it's like 116 pounds, which I won't say how many pounds ago that was, but you just learn that you're not gonna overpower every situation. So you have to rely on good communication. You have to rely on building relationships to even survive out there, let alone really thrive. Um, and so I think we, we bring a different thing to law enforcement. So yeah, I would love to see, you know, a female get an opportunity. And I would love to see an African-American get an opportunity. Um, the sad part in law enforcement is typically <laughs> black commanders only get an opportunity when things are really, really bad. Mm. Uh, they, you rarely see a black chief get to come into a good situation. And that's, that's part of the culture in law enforcement. That's, that's really true. really interesting perspective. Yeah. And I you can look at it across the, only when stuff is really, terribly bad will they want to insert you know open the door and insert a, a black person to fix it because it's terrible if people said Yvette we'd like you to apply would you I pray I've prayed on it and I've prayed on it and there was a part of me that does want to go back and then there's a part of me that says I think I'm better served to my community on the outside um just pushing us forward right you've taken some flack for it on Facebook oh yeah racist comments. Oh yeah. How do you deal with that? Um, it almost killed me, Rachel. <laughs> you know, um, you don't get immune to it. No, you don't. I mean, you know, I, I battled breast cancer and that's, it was a lot of it was stress. I mean, you don't realize the body blows you take, you know, once I started ascending through the police department, getting rank, it was not uncommon for me to get racial stuff like that. Um, when I was a finalist for chief, I wasn't, the, you know, I, I know I wasn't the FOP's pick, right? But just imagine working at Ford your whole life and paying dues <laughs> and realizing you're really not the brand. Um, what is the brand of LMPD? I'm, I'm talking more about the union. The versus. union versus, I felt like that. And they wield a lot of power, the union. They wield a lot of power, more than the police officers inside LMPD, because the union is still heavily based. And you saw some of the guys who commented, who made the racial comments to me, you know, uh, calling me everything under the sun, asking me was I scared. Those are FOP members. Those are not current police officers. But they do control a lot of the climate still around law enforcement. And that's unfortunate, because that's what makes it hard to shift the culture. Um, I'm sure you got kids in their 20s and whatever, right? They're different, right? They mingle and do stuff a lot different. You see the protests. They, they don't have the baggage that we they have. They don't have the baggage, right? And they, so they have the power to change it and the will. That's what gives me hope. Or that's what, that's exactly what gives me hope. And so they don't need people inside the culture of the union or whatever that, that don't have their best interests at heart. And, and being 
saying overtly racist thing is not in the best interest of anybody in this community, let alone the young officers out there trying. Two things to wrap things up. If you could say something to police officers out there right now in the midst of protesters and all of that, what would you say to them? Um, I just say to them, you have support. Uh, do the right thing, you know, um, and know that we understand that it's tough and I'm an advocate for, for, for them. And good. I, I spend the majority of my time, you know, advocating for them because I do know their minds and their hearts and I know the tough situation they have to be in, and just understand that it takes sometimes an outside influence to help move stuff along, because you're not gonna be able to move it by yourself. Um, and we all need to look at the George Floyd and agree that my sons are just as valuable as everybody else's sons. So be the police officer that you want, pulling your grandmother over, pulling your daughter over, be that cop because it almost seems like you have to choose. Are you on the side of the protesters? Or are you on the side of police? I understand why people are protesting. I went down mm -hmm. with our family and we went down to see firsthand because the George Floyd was so disturbing. The other cases, the Ahmed Arbery, all of these cases are so disturbing. Something is wrong. Right. Something needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. But I do have a respect you know, my grandfather was in law enforcement. Can you straddle that? I mean, can you be both? It's very complicated right now. Yeah, you ha yeah I, my brother's still out there. You know, my brother's out here on the, you know, you, out here on police. But you have sons. Yeah, you I worry about my, sons. Right. And my brother worries about my sons, you know? Um, and so that's why you have to have equity and you just, you just, you have to have that. But I'll say to the community too, Due process is the part of justice we gotta fight for. Um, and that means let's figure out what's real and be okay with waiting to see what's real in situations that are not glaring. I mean, the George Floyd, I mean, let's just be honest, yes. that we didn't need to wait, right? Um, but due process, give officers the benefit of that when they deserve it um, and don't just make them pay and hold other people accountable in the institutions too. You know, just don't, um, give people the benefit of the doubt. And then understand that everything that happens between a black and white officer is not about race, but when it is, sometimes it is about race, but not everything is. And there's people who could care less about Breonna Taylor's case, unfortunately, and any of this stuff, and they just, um, on both ends, that just want to keep confusion, right? So what would you say to the protesters? I would say, if you're protesting for justice, please keep protesting for justice because we need justice in this country bad. We've been fighting for it forever. We need to get the momentum to move forward to a more equitable system for everybody, a, a system that works for everybody. So I say, here's the water, you know. I, so that's what's weird. I mean, I, I will take stuff down there. I will help you. Um, but I also don't want to see bereaved parents like George Rodman and Breonna Taylor's mother have to be the poster child for, for fighting this. this. This can't be them, right? Because we don't want bereaved parents having to do this. We don't, we don't want that. We don't want desecrated memorials <laughs> from bereaved parents. And uh, we don't want people saying hateful stuff that she lost her daughter. Let's, let's just understand that. It's for, it's for the rest of us to do. Um, we, we don't need them out here having to do this. That's, we're better than that.